Lord, we long for this song that we have just sung to be our prayer as we turn our attention to your word. We long for you to shine into our, our darkness, into our ignorance, into our need, into our lack. We long for the exposure of light to expose any waywardness. We long for the piercing clarity of your word to show us, Father, the glory of your Son, so that we would see you and see your Son rightly. It is an inestimable privilege, Lord, to be able to look to your word, to look to truth, to be able to know you, the the God who has created everything, the, the God whom we have sinned against, whom we have offended, the God who you are alone among all of the pretend gods and man-made gods. You alone are the God who has sent your very Son, the Son of God, to die on a cross for sinners such as us. To give sinners divine righteousness that we could never have attained to, hung on to, earned, or achieved. And to give it to us as a gift by faith. So that when we worship you for all eternity in heaven, all creation will know that we are not there because of us, but we're there because of you. And this is how you get glory for yourself, Lord. That's how you get your glory for yourself in an eternal sense. And this morning, if we could be so bold, we would pray that you get glory for yourself in this sense, that we would see your glory on the pages of Scripture and we would see the glory of Christ in such a clear and profound way that our hearts would be fueled with confidence in who you are, and confidence in your character, encouraged by the glory of a compassionate Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. And so, Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, minister to our hearts in profound ways, ways that only your Spirit knows what we need, and only your Spirit has the ability to bring it to fruition. And we're so thankful for that. We ask all of this, Lord, simply so that you'd be pleased, glorified, and honored with us as your church. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, you may take a seat, and I want to invite you to grab your Bibles and open back up to Mark chapter 6. We're going to continue in our study of Mark this morning. I'm extremely excited about looking at this incredible story. Our text this morning reveals one of two miracles recorded by all four gospel writers. One, of course, is Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And the other is this one, the feeding of the 5,000. It's a powerful and memorable story for so many reasons. I can remember hearing this story as as a kid and just wondering, what would it have been like to watch Jesus distribute this one small sack lunch to 5,000 men assembled for a military takeover. What would that have looked like? I remember thinking, is this like some sort of uh, apparent sleight of hand, acting like he has to play the role of an illusionist, when even though he is simply creating food, as if he has a fish in one hand and then acts like he's passing it to the next to put it in the basket and then, oh, it's still there. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, yeah, it's still there. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to do that about 10,000 times over. And I remember thinking, like, what in the world would that have been like to watch this happen? It's a powerful story of an incredible display of creative power. And this powerful story has been used to tell all sorts of lessons and instructions. Some Good and some not so good. Typical lessons from feeding of the 5,000 might include, and I might be plagiarizing this off of a really diligent Google search that I did this week. Number one, typical lessons from the feeding of the 5,000. Number one, Jesus' compassion. And as we will see, Jesus' compassion is inarguably part of Mark's point. He makes that explicitly clear, as we'll see in verse 34. But as I looked at that particular exposition of the feeding of the 
5,000, his compassion was the expression of the physical feeding on physically hungry people. And it missed the whole point of what Mark is driving at. Another typical lesson from the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus uses other people to bless others. Another, Jesus is big enough for any expectation. And so if you came here this morning and you thought, man, my expectations are way bigger than Christ, well, then you can go read that online sermon and learn how (laughs) Christ is more than enough to fulfill any of your expectations. Number four, nothing we face here on earth is too big for God. And sometimes we get lost in details and we get lost in uh, things pertaining to our need, our lack, and we look at a story like this and we can find encouragement thinking, hmm, Christ is bigger than my expectation, he's bigger than my need, and those things would all be true, but we need to be very, very careful about how we define those things and what we're saying. Sometimes we even get lost in the fact of other parallel accounts. For instance, the story in John 6 is so familiar that uh, Andrew finds this young lad with this lunch that his mom probably diligently packed for him, and so then this is offered up. What is this small lunch with, so many, with such a massive need? And so it becomes a clear example of what God can do with so little. But in Mark's version, the boy doesn't even merit a mention, let alone does the fact that the food even come from someone else's lunch outside the 12. None of those details are even included. When we study the gospel of Mark, or any other gospel for that matter, it's important to ask a few questions of each narrative. Number one, what's the gospel writer doing in the larger context? What's he doing in the larger context? What are the purposes of this gospel writer in his gospel as a whole? And then even in the section of what he's documenting. And then secondly, what's the effect of the details? What's the impact of the details that the gospel writer actually uses to tell his own story? In other words, why is this story told this way and not another way? Why are these details included? Why are other details excluded? And and that's the attention of detail that we need to pay attention to to make sure that we understand the inspired point of the story. And so certainly we need to remember that here in Mark chapter 6. If you've been paying attention and if you've been here part of the study of Mark over the last several months, you'll know that in chapters 6 through 8, Mark is documenting the response of the disciples. This, this section from 1 through 8 is, is showing that Jesus' identity is quite shocking. He, he tells his readers, this is the Son of God. And as the story unfolds, it starts to become questioned by almost virtually everybody except the demons. Well, is he the Son of God? And he documents the unbelief of the, the religious leaders, and he documents the unbelief of the people of Israel. And now he's starting to document the slowness of the disciples to believe Jesus' identity. We saw that last time in chapter 6, verses 6 through 30, as Mark contrasts John the Baptist preaching of repentance with the 12 as they go out and preach repentance. One faithfully preaches repentance and gets his head cut off. And the other becomes enamored with their newfound authority over demons. And they're just still kind of in process and Jesus knows it. And he's got lessons to teach them and he's eager to teach them. It's interesting as we look at this feeding of the 5,000 in Mark's account, there are some details that are included in Mark's version of the story that we don't find anywhere else. We don't find it in Matthew. We don't find it in Luke. We don't find it in John. And those become important for us as we pay attention to what Mark is doing about the identity of Jesus Christ in the feeding of the 5,000. Of course, his theme is, Jesus is the Son of God, and he's proving that inarguably. But we could look at all the gospel writers, and they could prove their point from the feeding of the 5,000 as well. Jesus is the King of Israel. He is the Son of Man, and he is the Messiah. And when Mark comes along and says, look, Jesus is the Son of God, he points to some incredible details. In verse 34 of Mark chapter 6, verse 34, as we're about to read this story, I'm going to go ahead and read this verse up front so that you can see. Here's a detail that we don't find anywhere else except in Mark's version. 
He goes ashore. There's a large crowd. Jesus felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And now that concept of Jesus's compassion spilling over into this incredibly compulsive, um, irresistible impulse in the heart of Christ to give these people who don't have the truth that they need, to give them the instruction they are so desperate for. That detail is recorded in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 9, but not in the feeding of the 5,000, in Matthew chapter 14. Only here do we see that that's what presents this story in this fashion, is this overwhelming compassion of Christ seeing people who are like sheep without a shepherd. And then, later on in the story, he has them sit down, and they sit down in the green grass, it says. And when you see Mark describing this green grass, you think, well, what's, that's kind of an obsolete observation. What point does that possibly serve? We're going to find out that that actually contributes to this unique emphasis of the feeding of the 5,000. And so pay attention to those details as we look at this particular story. It's the lack of attention to the details, as Mark tells it, that sometimes lead to others finding completely different conclusions about the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, this story, this miracle, uh, as opposed to probably any other miracle that Jesus has performed, has been um, become misconstrued to almost picture Jesus as the prototypical social worker eradicating poverty and hunger. Robert T. Handy edited a book on the social gospel in America, and he traced uh, the, the emphasis on the social gospel to the, the um, 50 years, starting in 1870 all the way through 1920. And he documents a transformation in the articulation of the gospel in our own country through preachers like Washington Gladden and Walter Rauschenbusch. And of course, the overwhelming emphasis on the gospel being a message that is to make America a better place and increase human flourishing really does require a time period like the 1870 to 1920, before World War I and before World War II. And so at the dawning of World War I, the late 1910, 1914 to 1918, you've got uh, a little bit more of a pes honest pessimism about the po prospect of actually making the world a better place. But these preachers were a little bit dissatisfied with the preaching of the gospel that preached a gospel of forgiveness for sins against an infinitely holy God. These preachers saw the, the demise of, of poverty and, and uh, those who did not have advantages, particularly even in Hell's Kitchen in downtown New York. And so as these preachers saw the need, their message started to evolve as they articulated Christianity uh, motivated by pity and compassion for underprivileged people, they began to change in their emphasis. They started to minimize the doctrine of sin. Their view of man became much more positive. Their focus turned from Jesus' work on the cross to Jesus' character and person. And the eschatology became much more positive. And Robert T. Handy even showed how Washington Gladden viewed annihilationists, those who believe that when you die, you go out of existence. When you die in your sin, you go out of existence because he did not believe that God could or would um, punish justly. He began to view annihilationists who labored for, listen to this, the salvation of, of fellow men as brothers in Christ. That, not to beg the question, salvation from what? But of course, he's talking about salvation from poverty and temporal salvation from an underprivileged life. And Washington Gladden was also attempting to save the Christian faith from martyrdom at the hands of modernism. Modern science, post-Darwin, is looking at Claims of the miraculous, claims of a wonder worker like Jesus who would stand there with five loaves and two, two fish and just start distributing, and then suddenly, the next thing you know, voila, 5,000 grown men are well fed and satisfied, and there's leftovers. That kind of story, no. 
No, we, 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 we're, we've outgrown that. We are post-Darwin after all. And so Washington Gladden was trying to clean that up. And such a view would be a major miss to our understanding of the story. Obviously, as we read this story, you are going to see Jesus is very concerned about the physical needs of this group. That's inarguable. But that's not the motivating factor. In fact, what was driving Jesus here was the training of the twelve. He was still patiently looking to debrief with them after they got back from their mission of preaching the kingdom and preaching repentance and seeing their inversion of priorities um, for ministry. In the meantime, this massive mob of, uh, uh, follows him and they can't help but be motivated by their overwhelming and inescapable need that he extends himself in order to meet this critical need. He sees a need that they aren't even aware of. He sees this mob, and they need truth. They need light. They need clarity. That's their need. And he's motivated to meet that need. So motivated, he is compelled by it. It is an internal compulsion. It's a visceral response on the part of the man, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, and his compassion The pity stirs in his intestines because he is so intensely eager to meet this need that the mob is not even aware of. Their souls are starving. And meanwhile, they will tell you that their greatest need is physical. But that's just how bad it is. Sheep without a shepherd don't even know what their greatest need really is. And that's why... A shepherd is so critical. Let's read the story starting in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, and we'll read all the way through verse 44. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. The people saw them going, and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and it is already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples and to, uh, to set them to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate. And were satisfied. And they picked up 12 basketfuls of the broken pieces and also of the fish. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. As I mentioned in verse, verses 6 through 30, we have a story within a story. The 12 have just got back from their mission. They've been sent out to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to call Israel to repent. That was also John the Baptist's mission. John the Baptist was thrown in prison at the Machairus Palace, 10 miles east of the Dead Sea in modern-day Jordan. And at that party, he had his head cut off because he had been preaching to Herod to repent. When the disciples get back in verse 30... They gathered to Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. They were even more enamored by the powers and miracles and wonder working that they were performing than even their own message. And they're 
Their priorities are inverted. And seeing that and hearing that response and seeing the difference between John the Baptist and the 12, Jesus is thinking, no doubt, we need to get away by ourselves and we've got to debrief about your mission. And so in verse 31, when it says that he tells them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while, no doubt the Jesus being the consummate shepherd and being the consummate discipler has some training purposes in mind for the 12. And so they leave, and it explain, Mark even explains it was so hectic, so frenetic, that there was so much of a, of a publicity that the people were coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. It's like Jesus is sitting there having to just continue to teach, continue to instruct, and they don't even have time to sit down and have a proper meal. They can't even debrief over dinner about the, the ministry uh, that the 12 just returned from. And so they're looking to get some isolation. It's a little bit of R&R to get away. Now, it just says that they went to a secluded place. In verse 32, that's, that's all we know from Mark is it's a secluded place. If we look at Luke 9, um, verse 10, uh, it says that when the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. And now Bethsaida, there, there's a couple of potential locations. There's a known Bethsaida at the mouth of the Jordan River on the north edge of the Sea of Galilee. And there's also possibly one uh, even far, a little bit farther east of that, and which wouldn't be super uncommon for um, such a common name for different villages to have um, similar names. But either way, Luke puts it near a village called Bethsaida, and it's also desolate. Now, both could be true. It's probably outside of the village Bethsaida, and probably, obviously, in a desolate location right next to this particular town. Um, and then simply Mark uh, 6.32 just says it's a, a secluded place by themselves. And so this really is not much of a problem. They're coming from the west, from Capernaum, and they're going across the, toward the east, and they go land on the eastern shore, probably at a desolate spot on the far side of Bethsaida, because then on the return journey, it says that they go past Bethsaida and end up at Galilee, opposite, on the opposite side. And um, as Mark even records in the next story, he calls it Gennesaret. And they land at Gennesaret, which would have been the plains on the central western coast of the lake. So after this miracle, to go back across the, the lake to the west side would simply put them going past Bethsaida on the north. And so that makes perfect sense. None of, there's, no, there's no real conflict in interest. All that we need to realize is that they're going to an isolated place. But it doesn't work. Verse 33, the people saw them going and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. Now, this is quite an accomplishment. By the time you finish the story, we realize there's 5,000 men. And in fact, emphasis on men, it's 5,000 males. The word does not just mean 5,000 people. It means 5,000 males. It's not the typical word for man anthropos. It's actually the word for masculine gender. And there's a reason why. I believe it's very important to understand why, emphasizing 5,000 um, men. And 5,000 men to get ahead to the location, ahead of the boat, is quite an accomplishment. If I pick a random spot just east of Bethsaida to get them on the east side of the lake, to walk from Capernaum around that around the shore, depending on the water line of the particular year, it could be a good guess, could be about five miles. But to just go there by boat would be right around three miles. And so you have a group of 5,000 men so frenetically, intensely focused on this, whatever purpose they're aiming at, that they are willing to run, climb over the, climb through, swim through the Jordan River to get to this undesignated, desolate location on the east side of the lake, and they actually beat Jesus there when he's in, in the boat. And that's quite an accomplishment. This is an intense level of pursuit. Verse 34, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. I mean, they're there waiting for him. There's no, there's no dock. There's no town. It's just... Yeah, they're right there waiting, waiting for him to show up. And he gets out of the boat, and it's like, okay, well, we just went to get away and I'm going to debrief with my disciples and get a meal. 
There's 5,000 people there clamoring for my attention. Now, that kind of interruption, after such an exhausting ministry that was marked by such intense fervor that they did not even have time to eat, would no doubt cause for any of us a temptation to be frustrated at this inconvenience. I mean, after all, Lord, aren't I only interested in ministry? And now this inconvenience. Jesus isn't even inconvenienced. Look at Jesus' response to this. In verse 34, he goes ashore, he sees this large crowd, and he felt compassion for them. Jesus' desire to debrief with the twelve is good and righteous and holy. His desire to disciple the twelve is good and righteous and holy. And is even his desire out of human exhaustion for a little bit of break to be able to focus on training for future, further effective ministry is also very appropriate. There's nothing wrong with his desires. He sees this quote-unquote inconvenience and he looks at these men and he looks at the intensity of their fervor and he's filled with compassion. Pity. Not because what he sees is 5,000 hungry people but because of what he sees is 5,000 who need truth. These 5,000 need truth. He has compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They don't have direction. They don't have instruction. They don't have clarity from special revelation. They are confused. They are misguided. This word compassion is an incredible word. It's The same word in the original language for intestines. And you just turn it into a verb, and it means to feel compassion. Kind of like the command center for uh, the the Greek would be the mind, uh, the inclination center would be the heart. The visceral center would be the intestines. And this is something that Jesus is feeling. (coughs) Excuse me. It's a visceral response. In his gut, in his stomach, in his intestines, there's a a churning of pity and compassion because he sees these people and he sees their need. He's so motivated because he sees that they do not have a shepherd. They don't have instruction. They don't have spiritual feeding, spiritual protection, spiritual health. And that's what motivates him. He sees that lack, and he's compelled. In the in Mark fourteen fourteen, I'm sorry, in Matthew fourteen fourteen, and in Luke nine eleven, both of those verses record that he did do some healings here at this point, and of course that's only appropriate because that's just what he does when the Son of God shows up on earth. He's going to reverse the curse, and that's just in his spiritual. DNA. It's just who he is. So, of course, he's healing. But, of course, in a group of 5,000 that's able to outrun him on foot, there's not going to be a lot of healings um, necessary. This is a pretty healthy bunch. And uh, they got there made pretty good time. But notice, Mark doesn't even mention that. The compassion is not because of empty stomachs. The compassion is not because of need for physical healing. The compassion is not because their bank accounts are low. The compassion is their spiritual resources are on zero. They need light. They need truth. They need clarity. They need answers. They need instruction from God. They need their priorities set to God's priorities. That's what this bunch needs. And that's what is motivating Jesus Christ. That's why he is the shepherd par excellence, the shepherd. We'll come, to that in a, come back to that in a second. Verse 35, when it was already quite late, there were already a lot of hours gone in the day. Um, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate. It's already quite late. At this time of year, it's, it's March or April probably, and, and, and especially in light of the, uh, the green grass detail. Um, 
sun would be setting around 7 p.m., this time, particular uh, spot in the world. Perhaps it's already 5 p.m. Perhaps they're, they're, they're thinking, look, we only got a couple, day, a couple hours of daylight left. So let's let everybody just head back into the surrounding countryside and go to surrounding villages, and then they can buy themselves something to eat, verse 36. And that's a reasonable, reasonable suggestion. I mean, that's just interesting because basically that means that Jesus has been teaching all day. And by the way, when, in verse 34, when it says he began to teach them many things, you could translate that he was teaching a lot, a long time. There's a lot of teaching, a lot of instruction needed. He's so compelled by their need, he's going to meet that need. And his capacity to meet their spiritual need far exceeds their spiritual appetite. And so he's teaching a lot of things for a long period of time. Verse 37, but he answered them, you give them something to eat. So go ahead and take care of it. Meet the need. And they said to him, should we spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? Denarius is a Roman silver coin. It would have been a little more than five and a half grams. Um, it was basically the, the worker's average daily wage. It was reduced in its value under Nero. Um, but with a six-day work week, 200 denarii would be about eight months income. That's an expensive dinner. And so Jesus is telling them, you give them something to eat. And they're thinking like, they're doing the math and they're thinking about their, their, their salary and they're thinking about their, their money. Like, well, is that what you're saying? And so in verse 38, he says to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And honestly, it's just fascinating that, you know, from Mark's purposes, he doesn't even bring in the detail that John was bringing out, that Andrew had found this lad with the lunch. It doesn't, doesn't even, doesn't even bear, bear mention. It's just they found out and they said five and two fish. Jesus takes over in verse 39. He has everybody sit down by groups on the green grass. And uh, it's literally group by group. In verse 39, it's group by group. In verse 40, it's group by group. But the difference is they're different words for group. The word group by group in verse 39 is a group that would be a dinner group, a dinner party. So you can think dinner party by dinner party by dinner party. And interestingly enough, the verse 40 is uh, the word group by group. It, the word group there is much more idiomatic. It's actually a, a word that would mean like a, a garden plot, almost like a, a, a bed that you would use, like a raised planter bed. And so if I put those together, it's almost like Mark is describing this scene from the aerial view, looking down on 5,000 men assembled for these purposes, and they're sitting in group after group for getting ready for dinner. He says groups of hundreds and fifties, and um, even picturing them like little planter beds on this green grass and this green lawn. In verse 40, groups of hundreds and fifties is an interesting, interesting detail. It does evoke the memory of Elijah who had groups of 50 keep coming to haul him off to King Ahab and then they keep getting struck and killed. Uh, and this could be a military reference. What we do know from the Gospel of John is that the military political purposes is what is driving this group of these 5,000 men. Real quickly, let's look at John 6 for a second. This is an interesting, interesting comparison and contrast to look at what, what, what John says here. In John chapter 6, verse 15, John writes that Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. So we know from John's gospel that the intention of these 5,000 men was political and military in nature. They see what Jesus is doing. They, they like what they're seeing just by way of the miracles and by way of, he's not even loyal, he's not even, he's not even partisan to what's happening in Rome. He's just speaking truth, doing miracles, and they're like, okay, this is our guy. We don't need this, all this other political inter interference. Let's just make Jesus king. And so here they are ready to commit a coup, and Jesus is not interested in being a part of their coup. 
And so if we go back to Mark, it is interesting that Mark does include these details of the hundreds and fifties, which sounds like a military, military uh, uh, cohort or legion and then down to you know, a squad or a battalion. And it just, it's like they're broken up into these groups. But clearly we know from John that the military purpose was in the minds and hearts of the 5,000 and it was not in the mind and heart of Jesus Christ. So he is not interested in that at all. But he has them sitting down in their dinner parties. In verse 41, he takes the five loaves and the two fish. He looks up to heaven and he, he prays. He gives thanks. And then he breaks the loaves and he keeps giving them to the disciples over and over and over and over again to set before these 5,000. And he kept, he was dividing up the fish among them all and they all ate. They were all satisfied. This is not sleight of hand. You can't, you, what, do you, what could he possibly have, have done? Some sort of sleight of hand? Well, where did he store the original supply that he would have needed to try to pull off this sort of illusion? This is creative power. Creating food that did not previously exist out of two fish and five loaves so that 5,000 men ate and were satisfied. Oh, and that's not all. Verse 43, they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. And this word for basket, kafanos in the Greek, would be a smaller basket than is used of the word baskets in the feeding of the 4,000 when there were seven big baskets full. That that's more like a bushel basket. This is more like a personal lunch pail. And lo and behold, there's 12 left over. So after the disciples distribute all of this food to feed 5,000 men, lo and behold, there's 12 lunch pails left over. And then he includes the detail. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. And 5,000 is a, an immense gathering since the lar larger neighboring towns like Capernaum and Bethsaida only had two to 3,000 inhabitants each. And Capernaum would have been five to six miles away. This is a moment of intense popularity, intense zeal. These 5,000 men are not just happen to be men. I mean, of course, there probably are some women and children there for out of just by sheer curiosity. And obviously we know that there was one lad there who had the lunch. But the point is, is that they all document, all four accounts document that we're talking about males and it's a military intent and so you have a potential coup on hand with 5,000 men who are ready to take up arms. Jesus is not interested in that. Jesus is not interested in their coup, their military purposes, their desire for conquest, their desire for freedom. As one commentator wrote, if the crowd has been descri described as sheep without a shepherd, Jesus is presented as the shepherd who provides for all of their needs so that they lack nothing. As I mentioned in the introduction, this, this massive mob follows him and he can't help but be motivated by their overwhelming and inescapable need so that he even extends himself, sacrifices himself continues to teach when he's hungry and at great personal cost, he's so motivated by them getting the answers of the truth, the answers of the gospel, that they could see his identity so that they could worship him, so that they could be right with his father in heaven, so that they could see the glory of God and how it pertains to the nation of Israel. Their greatest need is truth. Their souls are starving. And meanwhile, they would tell you that their greatest need is physical food, Temporal freedom, a coup, and to increase human flourishing. And the feeding with the fish and the bread, it's, it's miraculous. And it attests to Jesus' identity. He is who he claims to be, or else he could not have fed 5,000 men with that one lunch. But just as important, as the parallel to Moses feeding the people in the wilderness with manna is the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is the shepherd. 
This story proves it. At great cost to himself, he's more motivated by people who don't even want the truth that they could have access to the truth. Let's just take a brief break from Mark for a second. Let's look at the, the Old Testament and what we ought to have in our minds and when we read this story and we want to understand and appreciate this story rightly. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 27. Back in the Torah, we have a, the prototype for Jesus is found in Moses and Joshua. In Numbers 27, we'll dive in at verse 16. Numbers 27, verse 16, Moses spoke to the Lord and here's what he said. May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them, who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit and lay your hands on him. So where Moses was the shepherd for the people, now Joshua is going to be the shepherd of the people. And Joshua becomes then the next leader in, in the like of Moses. Now, it's interesting throughout the era of the prophets that when the people of Israel don't have good prophets, but they are polluted and perverted by false prophets, it's interesting that they are described as sheep without a shepherd. Let me give you one example. Look at 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings 22, verse 17. And this is, again, the famous showdown um, where Ahab and um, uh, Jehoshaphat are looking to go up and, and fight against um, Aram. And should they, should they wage war? Should they not? And so they're thinking, well, we should ask a prophet. And they ask the prophets that are there in the north, and they're all false prophets. And, um, you know, and the, the question is, well, sure, okay, they all say go fight, but... Do we have a real prophet? That's the question. And they, they pull out Micaiah. Micaiah is the only true prophet. Ahab doesn't like him because he, he always says things that are negative. And so he doesn't like Micaiah. And he asks Micaiah in verse um, 13, he says, Behold, the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Please let your word be like the, one of them, the word of one of them and speak favorably. And so Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, I shall repeat. And when he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered and said, Go and succeed. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. And he probably said it without that, about that much enthusiasm, because he saw through the ploy. The king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So then he says, Okay, you want, you want a real answer? Here you go. I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. In other words, don't go up for war. I'm not with you. There's no leader. No one's listening to my word. This group of people are like sheep without a shepherd. Let's turn over to the Psalms for a second. And you had to know this was coming. Look at Psalm 23. When Mark tells the story of the feeding of the 5,000, I don't believe it's any coincidence at all that he's the only one that includes the detail that Jesus was so motivated by pity and compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he also includes the detail of the green grass. Look at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Yahweh is my shepherd. So for Mark to say, look at Jesus of Nazareth. He's the shepherd. He has a compulsive shepherding impulse. He is Yahweh. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me along a path that is righteous so that my life would glorify his name, his character, his reputation. That's what it means to be shepherded so that my life could actually bear testimony to the glory of God's own righteousness. Verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We could look at about four more verses. I'll just, I'll just for the sake of time, let me just give you one. Look at Psalm 95. Kyle did a great job. He brought this to us on Sunday night. And this is such a great psalm. And it's connected precisely to the idea of what it means for people to be God's sheep and for him to be their shepherd. Verse 6, Psalm 95, verse 6, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We eat out of his hand. We are his pasture. We are his people. He is our God. He created us. He sustains us. He feeds us. He cares for us. He protects us. So let's get busy worshiping him. Let's get busy kneeling down before him because he is our maker. You can also look at Psalm 74, 1, Psalm 79, 13, Psalm 100, verse 3. Let's quickly fast forward to some prophecy. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23, one of my favorite Chapters in the entire Old Testament it has to be Jeremiah 23. It's just a profound, profound chapter where God describes uh, the, the false prophets who are denounced and he gives Jeremiah his true revelation, his true secret counsel is revealed through Jeremiah to the people. But he starts with woe being pronounced, condemnation being pronounced on all the influences of the people of God who are false influences, who are not giving them clarity from God's word. Verse 1 says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you've scattered my flock. You've driven them away. You have not attended to them. Behold, I'm about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. What's going to happen then? Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all of the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their pasture and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend to them. They will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, This is an offshoot of David. This is the son of David. This is the Messiah. And I'm going to raise up the Messiah. He will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called. Yahweh, our righteousness. The name of the son of David. Who will be a very real human of human lineage, descended from David. He's going to be called Yahweh, our righteousness. Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, who is the source of humans having divine righteousness. That's his name. And that's what it means to be a shepherd. Look at Ezekiel chapter 34. This is such a profound prophecy. It's an expanded prophecy of what we just saw in those first six verses of Jeremiah 23. And the woe to these false shepherds um, goes from verse 1 all the way down through verse 10. He says, prophesy, son of man, in verse 2, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Woe, shepherds of Israel, you, you are feeding yourselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? They're not feeding the sheep. They're getting fat off of the sheep. They're eating the sheep's food. They're fleecing the sheep. They're getting rich off the sheep. They're they're making their, their lives more comfortable off the sheep. They're not actually feeding the sheep, caring for the sheep, looking out for them. They're not caring for them physically. They're not caring for them medically. They're not feeding them. Verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search out for my sheep and I will seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and deliver them out of, from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. This is an incredible prophecy where Yahweh God is speaking about his own personal shepherding of, the, of his own people. Skip down to verse 23. Then I will, and then being on that day, I will set over them one shepherd. My servant David. 
and he will feed them and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord will be their God and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord have spoken. God says, I'm going to shepherd my sheep and I'm going to do it through David, my own son who will rule and reign. And we can multiply prophecies. Zechariah 10 verses 2 and 3 talked about the people of Israel being without a, she- a sheep without a shepherd because there was no leader and there's no one who's teaching them truth. They're telling false dreams, false visions, perverting the people of God, cutting them off from truth, and all they know about God is error. But the last one I want to end on is the one that no doubt had to be most direct to Mark's purposes because it's the prophecy that he started his gospel with, Isaiah chapter 40. Go to Isaiah 40 for a minute. And if you remember when we started the, the book of Mark, he has a quote from the Old Testament that includes Exodus 23, Isaiah 40, and Malachi 3. And this prophecy is no doubt in his mind when he's making the thesis, Jesus, this is the gospel of Jesus, the Son of God. Isaiah 40, verses 9 through 11. Follow along with these three verses. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. There's the definition of gospel according to Isaiah. Gospel is good news. God is coming to earth. God's coming to earth. You need to listen to Steve's exposition of this from a few weeks ago. Behold, Yahweh God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. His arm is his power. His arm is his might. His arm would be the arm of the Lord at this point in history has been most notably shown in the Exodus. When Deuteronomy 4 verse 32, Moses writes, Has a God ever tried to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm, and by great terrors as the Lord your God did for, for you in Egypt before your eyes? And here, God's saying, I'm going to come to earth in person, in human form, and my arm is going to be ruling for me. Behold, his reward is with him. His recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Tender, full of pity, full of compassion, full of mercy, motivated by spiritual health, spiritual blessing, the glory of his father, and the welfare of his sheep. He is going to shepherd the sheep. Godfrey Bowen is a uh, former world record holder. He um, cheered 456 full wool ewes in nine hours. Not that you need to know that, but I think that adds some credibility to what I'm about to read to you. He describes this. He says, people may not be aware of it, but sheep spend most of their lives eating and drinking, grazing, munching, and ruminating. They are often thirsty and hungry, especially when left on their own without a shepherd. Sheep must have water to quench their thirst and food to nourish their bodies. On its own, a sheep cannot find its own water or food. Sheep have to have water, clean water, pure water, and adequate water. It must be accessible at all times. It must be free of contamination and pollution. It must not be hot or cold in the extreme. It must not pose a danger to the sheep. It should not be rapid or fast moving, for sheep naturally prefer still waters. It must not be stagnant, alkaline, or saturated with harmful chemicals. It must not be a marsh, a slough, or a standing body of water that breeds flies, mosquitoes, gnats, or parasites that may threaten the health and safety of the flock. For sheep, the water must be close by, so that the flock need not travel a great distance to try to find it to quench their thirst and obtain refreshment. Most animals are able to smell water on the wind at great distances. And I'm just going to paraphrase this. He goes on to talk about wildebeest in Africa, elk and reindeer in the hinterland of the northern hemisphere, and buffalo, and now back to the sheep. But alas, the the sheep is not so gifted. (laughs) Once it has devoured its range, it is unable to seek new grounds, but simply wanders aimlessly, eating the stubble and roots until there is only dirt left. 
Abundant pasture may lie only a few miles away on a higher plane, but the sheep on its own is incapable of sensing it or finding it. This is also true of water. Once the water supply is exhausted, the sheep are unable to search for, for or find water. The greatest distance that sheep will graze away from their water source is a day's march of 10 to 15 miles, allowing them to return to drink at their known water hole. If the water or well should dry up, the sheep will die of thirst, standing and staring at the dry mud. You just picture, this is, my, this is my pasture. No more green left. I'm just going to stand here and stare at the dirt. Maybe, I'll, maybe green will grow before I die. Staring at their empty water hole. I thought, what an appropriate picture. What an appropriate picture. Man in sin, we are like sheep. We don't even know our need. This group of 5,000 men had military, political purposes on their mind. Jesus knew it. He was not turned off by it. He was filled with compassion because he knew they were confused. He knew they had sincere motives, but they were totally illusioned about how this was going to go down. He knew they needed to be aware of their sin. He knew they, all they wanted was red carpet, no more Caesar. They wanted freedom. They wanted political coup at any cost. And he just thinks they need truth. And I'm going to give it to them. And I'm even going to teach so long that their stomachs won't even be able to keep up with me. And then I'll go ahead and provide for that. And then you fast forward 24 hours later and they follow him back across the lake. And John 6 says, you did not come here because you wanted truth. You came here because you wanted your bellies filled. Jesus even knows they do not have the spiritual appetite for what he's giving them. Their actual need. His Passion for their spiritual health is even exceeds our appetites. He's that good of a shepherd. Christ's compassion for us cannot possibly be legitimately questioned. You ever find yourself asking that question? Christ, is this is enough enough? Do you do you really know what I need? This is the mark of a true shepherd. His zeal to give us the truth exceeds our own appetite for it. His zeal is in spite of the fact that their purposes are not his purposes. In spite of the fact that he was trying to debrief with his disciples. In spite of the fact he's not even trying to minister to them. It just shows up and he can't help but be compelled by the need. He's willing to give us what we need, whether we're in adversity, whether we're in prosperity. He knows that we need instruction. We need the truth. Our need is found sufficiently in the scriptures. Sometimes we come with questions looking for answers and we can search this thing dry and find out there's no answer to that question. And we learn, oh, I don't need to ask that question anymore. Wrong question. His desires to meet my need exceed my appetite to, for my need to be met. I can't even identify my need. He is the shepherd. God even warns Israel in Deuteronomy 8. He says, watch out when I fulfill my promises and get you into the promised land and you're blessed. Watch out that it doesn't go to your head. Watch out that you don't forget the lesson that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that's what Jesus is doing. Who could possibly question God's compassion and pity for us in our circumstances? That's exactly why we're in the circumstances we're in, because he knows our need, and he knows our need is to hunger for the truth. John Flavel said this, Nothing grieves him more than our groundless and unworthy suspicions of his designs. Would it not grieve a tender-hearted physician? And we can say, tender-hearted, good shepherd. Would it not grieve a faithful, tender-hearted, good shepherd when he had studied the case of his patient and prepared the most excellent medicines to save his life to hear him cry out, Oh, he's undone me. He's poisoned me because it, because it pains him in the operation. This is the display of Christ as the Son of God because he is the shepherd. This is the branch of David. This is the one who will shepherd the sheep. 
Christ's ministry was not even accepted by the massive majority of this 5,000. They just wanted more signs, more wonders. They didn't believe his message. But he didn't hesitate to give them the sufficient promises of the word of God because he knew what they needed. And Christian, that's exactly what we need. Christ is our good shepherd. He makes no mistake. We cannot legitimately doubt his compassion for us. He will shepherd his sheep. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for sending your son. and Thank you for making it so clear that he is indeed the son of God. Thank you for showing that even down to the very detail of this compulsion that Christ was motivated by the need of these people who did not know what they needed. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for being the good shepherd. Thank you for loving us more than we would love ourselves. Lord, forgive us for ever doubting your purposes and forever doubting your shepherding in our own lives. Thank you for the rebuke that this narrative is to see that all of your shepherding is motivated by the most profound and the most pure mercy and compassion. We don't deserve that. But you so abundantly give it because that's your character, that's your heart. That's your compulsion. It's who you are. Lord, thank you for being so condescending. Thank you for shepherding us. We long to be your sheep. We love the thought that you are our shepherd. We love the thought that we have the privilege of eating out of your hand, of following your leadership and your guidance, listening to your word, and obeying all that you've commanded to us to do and to be. Continue leading us, continue guiding us, continue feeding us, continue protecting us. And Lord, I pray that as your sheep, we would give you all glory, all honor as sheep who will gladly, simply follow your shepherding. That's all we can do and that's all we want to do. In your name we pray. Amen.